Sandwich, my beautiful, beautiful sandwich. Who ate it? Who? Was it you, the faceless man? The hell are you talking about? How am I going to eat a sandwich? I'm essentially a pair of hands and some drapes. I don't even have a mouth, much less a digestive system. Did you eat it? The man covered in metal. You're barking up the wrong tree, laddie. Where I come from, we didn't have sandwiches. To me, that's some sort of pagan god to be worshipped. Oh, hell, the sandwich! <laughs> My sandwich, you! Time-traveling idiot! Oh, oh, I've only mitigated call! I'll have you know I only eat nutritious space pills. A whole meal and a single pill. This is Jamie's estrogen. He's transitioning. <clears throat> Jamie! What about you, the guest star editor for shock value to drive up sales? Did you eat my sandwich? No, I did not eat your sandwich. I did not. All right, this uh, fulfills my obligation to comic book issues, contracts, and the like, and uh, I'm out. It's hopeless. After a year's investigation and not changing my shirt that entire time, I'm no closer to finding out who ate my sandwich. It's like a mystery wrapped in a sweater that someone keeps knitting and knitting and knitting and knitting. Oh, for knitting, God's sakes, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Here, I made you another sandwich. Knitting. Oh, that's great. <laughs> when did you make this? I made that sandwich at the same time you made yours a year ago. I use bleach to keep the bread white! <laughs> Enjoy the show? Blah! Hi everyone, welcome back to Comic Book Issues. I'm your host, The Last Angry Geek. You know, some ideas work out so well that you can repeat them ad nauseum and always have a modicum of the same success. Then there are the weekly series put out by DC Comics. Following the events of Infinite Crisis, all the monthly DC Comics resumed with the theme of One Year Later. We did a time jump and now found our heroes in new scenarios. But what of that missing year when Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman were all off the grid? DC decided to tell that story in real time by putting out a weekly series over the course of a year called 52. Following B-list characters as they filled in for A-list heroes and plotted by such A-list talent as Keith Giffen, Grant Morrison, and Jeff Johns, the book was massively popular and hugely successful. So, of course, DC's co-publisher Dan DiDio hated it. He followed it up with another weekly series called Countdown, which, in his words, was 52 done right. It led into the next event, Final Crisis, and ended up contradicting much of the story that was being told by Final Crisis writer Grant Morrison. The book sold poorly and is pretty much considered a mess. There was a third weekly series called Trinity that featured the DC debut of penciler Mark Bagley, but terrible sales followed that book and pretty much killed off the weekly line until last year when the DCNU brought it back with Batman Eternal, a book that I felt was okay at best. So is it true that you can only catch lightning in a bottle once, which isn't really how that phrase goes? Well, let's wind the clock back and take a look at the very first month as we review the first four issues of 52. The first issue of 52 opens with shattered crystals showing the events of the Infinite Crisis slowly burning away to reveal New Earth. Ralph Dibney, a widower since his wife's murder, wanders through his destroyed home. Renee Montoya, former Gotham City police detective, spends her days drinking in a bar. Steel, John Henry Irons, helps to rebuild Paris following the war with the supervillains. And in Metropolis, Booster Gold takes out the villain Mammoth, as announced by his robotic pal Skeets. He stops for a photo op, assuring a little girl that Wonder Woman is indeed alive and well. 
We see his uniform is full of logos before he pops a cola and smiles at the crowd. However, he quickly turns on the tears for the press, playing on public sympathy for Superboy's death. Skeets and Booster traveled back in time to this legendary Age of Heroes to make Booster a star. According to Skeets' historical records, which is how Booster finds and stops so many crimes and disasters, tomorrow, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman will form a new Justice League and ask Booster to be a part of it. Alone in a hotel, Ralph ignores the calls from his former teammates and slowly places a gun in his mouth, until hearing that his wife's tombstone was desecrated. Flying across Metropolis, Steel stops his niece, Natasha. He needs her help to clean up the debris in the city, but she's on her way to join the Teen Titans. Disgusted by her attitude, he depowers her armor. If she wants to be a superhero, she can build her own armor. Pshaw! I do that all the time! In fact, they're not just suits of armor, they're a lot like Skeets. They're my best friends. What's that? Well, they have a right to be here. They're fans of my show. No, but I... Read a story that sailor suit doesn't fit me anymore! I, oh, no! All right, I'll dance for you! <laughs> Why are you so mean to me? In the country of Kamdok, Black Adam professes to his people that they will be an ideal for the rest of the world to live up to. A suicide bomber threatens the crowd, but Adam rips his arm off and demands to know who sent him. In his lab, Dr. Savannah watches the televised coverage of Superboy's funeral, talking to Mr. Mind, when two creatures break into his lab and carry him away. The survivors of the Infinite Crisis gather for Superboy's funeral. Skeets counts down to Superman's announcement, which Booster tops off with a tasteful, ta-da, before they realize nothing's happening. As Skeets suddenly shorts out, Booster grows hysterical, demanding to know where Superman is. He accidentally elbows a reporter in the face, giving him a bloody nose. But Clark Kent still tells him Superman isn't coming. The next day in Gotham, we see a man tear down the bat symbol before painting a question mark on the floodlight. The question then turns the light on. In her apartment, still wrought with guilt because she couldn't bring herself to kill the man who murdered her partner, Renee is drinking herself into oblivion, barely noticing the Dear Jane letter her girlfriend left behind when the floodlight blinds her. With a question mark projected onto her apartment, the question asks, is she ready? I said, are you ready? Then, for the thousands in attendance and the mill... <clears throat> Thousands watching at home. Ooh, let's get ready to... Sir, I represent both Michael Buffer and Triple H. If you continue any further, you'll be leaving yourself actionable to two very expensive lawsuits. This is a cease and desist order ordering you to cease and desist. Week two begins with Ralph photographing the graffiti on Sue's gravestone. Ralph realizes that this is a message for him left in the one place he would be sure to return to. Booster Gold is at Dr. Will Magnus's lab. The creator of the Metal Man can't find anything wrong with Skeets, who is just happy to have some time off. Skeets is convinced that it was just a glitch, and Magnus is off to see his mentor, the super criminal inventor Professor T. Omaro, the man who invented the Red Tornado. Although he can't figure out why the tornado sacrificed himself to save the universe during the Infinite Crisis. Both men admit they don't understand the other's impulses, but still appreciate their friendship. However, Maro has noted the recent abduction of Savannah and other super geniuses. Someone is rounding up criminal scientists. Man, we don't need a criminal scientist. We need a criminal scientist. Coming this summer to AMC, it's Manana Savannah. Renee awakens in the middle of the night with <clears throat> some company to find the question standing over her. She fires, but there's no body. Only an address with the question mark left behind. Booster heads to save a plane about to crash, but Skeets has given him the wrong direction. He's barely able to recover and save the plane. With nothing better to do, Renee heads to the address in the Gotham slums. The question appears behind her and quickly outfights her. He knows Renee is technically a private investigator now and hires her to watch the building for the next three weeks before disappearing. In front of a Kryptonian idol, a young woman concludes her online sermon. It's Cassie Sandsmark, Wonder Girl of the Teen Titans. Ralph walks into Titan's Tower. He thinks the message on his wife's tombstone was left by her. The S-Shield of the Superman family actually means hope in Kryptonian, but upside down? It stands for resurrection. Week 3 opens with the Gotham Police Department finding the corpse of Lex Luthor. I have to admit that corpse looks pretty damn good after rotting in an alley for the last three weeks. That's why he uses Glam Dead. It's the only makeup designed to make your corpse look beautiful months after you die. The only makeup good enough for Lex Luthor. Dan DiDio! Power Girl of the JSA is pursuing criminal Terra Man when she's stopped by Black Adam. 
They've invaded Kandak's airspace, and he won't have her or any hero in his country. Back in Metropolis, Natasha is upset that her uncle has enrolled her in summer school to make up for a D in English. She shouldn't be wasting her time when she aced all her science courses. John points out that she has no trouble with those, but when challenged with something that's not naturally easy to her, she blows it off. He's then contacted by Star Labs. Back in Kandak, Black Adam has brought $2 million and a beautiful virgin by two men who represent Intergang. The criminal syndicate, which has evolved into a sort of religion, worshipping crime itself. They want access to the Kandak Embassy in New York to traffic alien weaponry. The woman fights back, but is quickly subdued when Black Adam kills both men. Hi. We here at Comic Book Issues would like to take a moment to remind everyone that Kandak is a fictional country and is in no way indicative of what's going on in the Middle East, where everything is perfect and everyone gets along. Back in Metropolis, Skeets moves a cart vendor out of the way as Booster Gold blows through the ground, fighting the armored shockwave. Later, he's congratulated by his latest sponsor, Acteon Holt, who he's also invested heavily in. But before he can become a billionaire, the company's CEO is arrested for securities fraud. Skeets has blown it again! Even Skeets has to admit that he might be malfunctioning, so Booster has him try and track down the time-traveling hero, Rip Hunter. Examining Luthor's corpse, John finds colored contacts. He realizes this is Alexander Luthor, the crisis's architect, but John thinks the contacts were inserted post-mortem by Lex Luthor, who interrupts the autopsy. He exposes the body and uses this opportunity to explain away all of his criminal actions since abandoning the presidency on his doppelganger. He then calls on Dr. Irons to verify this, treating on Steele's good standing with the public to further whitewash his sullied name. As rumors abound that Black Adam is going to make his country haven for terrorists, Lois Lane and reporters cover his appearance at his country's embassy in the U.S. He appears with Terra Man and announces his intention to find allies to fill Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman's void. Allies who will make sure that scum like Terra Man don't live. He then dismembers the villain with his bare hands and promises to change the world as we see a small cocoon in Mr. Mind's glass tube. In Gotham, Renee is going nuts watching these slums where nothing is happening. While in space, a group of astronauts has spent the last month trying to track down the missing heroes from Infinite Crisis. One of their numbers, Halo, formerly of the Outsiders. She can sense that the Zeta Beam, a sort of interstellar teleportation system, is out there looking to connect with Earth. In Booster's apartment, his former Justice League International teammate, Fire, wants him to help her look for the heroes, but Booster isn't interested. Hey, he did the right thing when his best friend Ted Cord, the Blue Beetle, died. He went back to the future and got the information the heroes needed to save the day, but now it's all about him. He wants an easy life full of fame and money, and that attitude quickly alienates Fire. With only four days left paid for, Renee's taken off guard by the question's appearance. How long has Renee smoked? Hey, she's not interested in small talk. Nothing's happening here. John Henry Irons begins to flash back to his decision to quit being steel. However, as he gets sick, we realize this is a hallucination. He's been poisoned and screams in agony as his body begins to coat itself in liquid metal. Wonder Girl introduces Ralph to the leader of the Kryptonian resurrection cult, Devum. They can let Ralph have a vision, but he needs to sacrifice something that has personal meaning to him. But Ralph doesn't have anything left like that after losing Sue, so the cult shoves him underwater until he almost passes out. When he surfaces, the cult and his wedding ring are both gone. Nodding off, Renee almost misses a hulking figure into the building. She follows him in, but is again snuck up on by the question. She switches on the lights, but instead activates a trap door. They land in front of a large insectoid creature moving crates. He shrugs off Renee's bullets and breaks her arm. As the question busts out the Kung Fu, she picks up a nearby ray gun and quickly turns the beast into vapor. Meanwhile, the astronauts have managed to coax the Zeta Beam to land in Australia. It hits, and indeed contains the missing heroes, but Green Lantern has lost an eye, Bumblebee is shrunk down while Hawkwoman is enlarged, and the rest are suffering horrific damage, all near death. Well, that's the first four issues of 52. <laughs> Man, it almost feels like a month. Lingering questions were answered and new plots were set up. So did I like this series? Well, given how much I raved about it in the opening, I think that's a given. But was it flawless? Perfect. Let's take a closer look. To start with, the art for this entire book was based on breakdowns provided by Keith Giffen. That meant, no matter what, the feel of the book would be consistent, even if the pencilers drawing it had radically different styles. That said, the first four issues were drawn by Joe Bennett. The art's decent. Not great, not terrible. Bennett had a head start, but later runs of 52 would feature a different penciler on every issue, so you should enjoy the continuity while you can. 
If you're a longtime fan of comic book issues, you may remember that in my first year I did a review of several art books, one of which was 52, The Covers. Without a doubt, the covers provided by J.G. Jones are amazing. He touches on many different styles and genres, all the while teasing the story to come in that issue. He even provided covers for their eventual trade paperback collections and the novelization. Yes, novelization. DC was going through a bit of a phase where they took their events and put out book versions. Deciding not to go insane with writing, the author limited the stories told to those of Renee, Black Adam, and Booster Gold. Say what you will about the novelization, this led to a very enjoyable full cast audio adaptation by the people at Graphic Audio. Now on to the story. This book was written in segments by Jeff Johns, Grant Morrison, who returned to his old character Animal Man, Greg Ruka, who I'm reasonably sure handled the Renee Montoya arc as he wrote her in Gotham Central, Mark Wade, and the aforementioned Keith Giffen. Now, some might claim too many chefs, and there were some things that never paid off. For instance, the Kryptonian called in its leader, Devum, disappear about a third of the way through the story, exposed as frauds, but leading Ralph to explore a larger world of magic. We also get some things shoehorned in that never really feel important to the story, but have to be included so that we can understand what's happening in the one year later titles. Like the heroes returning from space at the end of issue four. This explains why in Checkmate and JSA, Alan Scott has only one eye. Why the nearly dead Mal and Bumblebee joined the Doom Patrol as only the Chief could save their lives. All things that had to be explained, but don't really advance the story in 52. But what really wrapped me in were the little things that paid off nearly a year later. Like that flask Ralph is constantly drinking from, or the gun he puts in his mouth. Things like Vic's interest in Renee's smoking habits. These lead to some pretty amazing developments for these C-list characters, and true change in a comic character is a rare thing. Superman is always going to be Superman, Wonder Woman is always going to be Wonder Woman, and Batman will always be Batman, no matter who wears the costumes. But in 52, several characters die and are replaced. Heck, some die and are not replaced. Others undergo a significant change that puts them into a new position in the DC Universe, and others just end up back where they started. 52 is nominally about a year without heroes, but really, it's about what makes a hero. The drive to protect the innocent and weak. The need to return home at the end of your journey. 52 was a story that featured aliens, gods, and superheroes, and it was about change. And what's more human than that? 52 is a damn good story. Not perfect, given how long it is. You're always going to lose things and change story elements along the way. But what we got was pretty consistently good. I give 52, issues 1 through 4, 4 out of 5 stars. Hey, hoping it won't be a year until we see each other again. Until that time, this is Comic Book Issues, and I'm your host, The Last Angry Geek.